people's heads? Cullen asked, closing the box. You can erase everything, cut the relay, and collapse the wormhole, but you'll still have 1,600 people who now know quite a lot about Nomad, and the existence of the planet itself was never a secret. He paused as if he was reordering his thoughts. And if people here survive, well, even if only one person does, then APS has a source. Director, you're going to be here. Do you seriously think they won't ask you a few questions, and not particularly politely? So this asset denial plan only works if you destroy the place along with everyone in it who can talk. How many times do we have to go through this? Erskine had had enough. The only way through was forward. It's not a perfect plan, I know that. But the less information APS can extract, the better the mission's chance of continuing uninterrupted. Even if removing the FTL data only delays APS by a year or two, it's more time for the colony to prepare for... Oh, well, I don't know what, but I have to imagine the worst. What did you tell Ingram? Nothing. What could I tell her that would be of any use? Stand by for APS arriving, maybe before we do? It's too late for all this, Will. So if anyone survives, if they can get the comms mast working again, if Solomon can access Shackleton, do you really think they'll let him fix the ship when they find we've stripped the place? If they let Elcano leave, they'll let Shackleton leave, Erskine said. The ships are of no interest to them. They'd have moved in on them by now if they thought there was anything they wanted. Cullen looked around the server room and checked another poll before consulting his screen and taking out a few more memory modules. I think you're still lying to yourself, he said. Maybe, but the only bit that works is getting as many people away as we can, while we can, with as big a head start on APS as we can. If you've suddenly had a flash of inspiration, though, let's hear it. Cullen put the extra modules in the box and handed it to Erskine. I haven't. We've got no guarantee that giving APS everything would make the slightest bit of difference. We're just assuming that it would. I find everything more distasteful after sleeping on it, that's all. You think I don't? Will, we're out of time. I need to go talk to Propulsion now. And we still haven't found Kim. She can't get a message out. But we have to keep her away from APS. Permanently. Erskine picked her way out of the darkened room, almost stumbling into the storage columns in her hurry to leave, and started the buggy. Right then, she hated Cullen for chipping away at her resolve after she'd made an agonizing decision. She drove down the dimly lit passages, aware she'd walked off without a goodbye, and that she might not see him again to put that right. As if that's the worst thing I've done today. Propulsion was at the far end of the corridor that ran under the accommodation block. While the system was down, she couldn't check in advance whether Ben and Javender were in there, but it was the obvious place to start. When she reached the doors to the department, she had to get out of the buggy and dog them open by hand. As soon as she pulled one door back, she could hear voices. Javender was in the front office then. Erskine parked the buggy to one side of the corridor and put her head around the office door. The first thing she saw was Ben sitting at one of the desks, blood spattered on his light blue T-shirt. Javender was leaning over him with an antiseptic wipe. It took her a moment to notice the cut above Ben's eye, right on the brow bone. What happened? Did you walk into something when the power went off? No, I walked into an angry physicist, Ben said. Kim, she slammed my head in the door. I mean, in the door. Between the door and the frame. She was trying to hack into files she isn't allowed access to. Damn, Ben, we've been looking for her for hours. Where the hell is she? Why didn't you call it in? He jerked his thumb over his shoulder. Because the power was out by the time I locked her in the equipment store. Which files? Did she manage to get into them? Wormhole, Ben said. 
Javender didn't seem to be having much luck stopping the bleeding. He pressed a lint pad on the cut and put more pressure on it, making Ben wince. I confronted her. We had a row, and it escalated from there. No idea if she accessed them. I didn't even see her come in today. I just noticed the activity on the system and found her in the other office. Erskine held up the box of memory modules. Well, no need to worry about that now. Cullen removed all your data storage. It goes with you to Opus. So she really is a spy, isn't she? Whether she is or not, she's an intel source for APS. Ben took Javinder's hand off his dressing and held the pad in place himself. Is it true she wanted to trade our research for postponing the bombing? This place was a sieve. Erskine decided to give up worrying about how things leaked and concentrate on her next task, making sure that Kim got on the shuttle. She looked Ben over more carefully. He was pretty fit, and if he'd manhandled Kim into the storeroom, then he wouldn't be afraid of using a bit of force to make sure she boarded Elcano as well. I don't know if it was her idea, Erskine said. It was put to me in a meeting, and I felt it would compromise the mission. And we don't know if it would persuade APS. Erskine braced for yet another speech on whether it was really so bad to hand over information. But Ben just nodded. Damn right, he said. This is our last chance. They could just wait out the contamination, walk in and take over. Exactly. So I can't risk her surviving the blast, and I don't have the backbone or means to shoot her. So you have to take her with you. Terrific. I do mean take, Ben. I can't call on Trender's people now. But I need someone to physically restrain her if she won't go voluntarily. Just grab her and subdue her. Ben peeled the lint off his cut and checked the blood. Okay. If she hits you again, hit her back. It was the door. It was deliberate, but it was the door. Fine, then jam her head in the door if that makes you feel it's a fair fight. She's a risk. Treat her accordingly. So what do we do with her in between now and the launch? Javender asked. I'm going to speak to her. Is that wise? Perhaps not, but I'm going to do it anyway. Okay, Javender said. One moment. While he was gone, Erskine passed the time helping Ben put a dressing on his cut. Javender returned, holding a hockey stick that looked like it had seen a lot of service. For self-defense, he said, handing it to her. Please don't break it. It was my dad's. I still play, too. You think she's that violent? Seriously? Ben scowled. No, she's an angel, and this is fake blood. Erskine wasn't any more used to fisticuffs than most of the staff here. She'd never even had to deal with a toddler having a tantrum. But the sight of the stick alone might persuade Kim to behave herself. I'm too old to slug it out, Erskine hefted the stick in both hands. Okay, open the door. And if you're really worried about me, wait outside. If I need rescuing, you'll hear thuds. Javender led Erskine along the corridor and pointed to the storeroom door. There was a safety glass panel down the center, and Erskine could see Kim sitting at one of the desks, doing nothing in particular. It was a much bigger room than she expected, more like a small office. She hoped that Kim hadn't made an improvised weapon out of the cleaning supplies. Open it, she said. Kim looked around when she walked in, but didn't get up. She glanced at the hockey stick. Erskine stayed near the door and just leaned casually on the stick, ready to deploy it if Kim so much as twitched. You've upset Dr. Singh, Erskine said. And Ben? Kim shrugged. He'll leave. So you don't want to come to Opus. We've saved you a cryopod. I never said I would. I said I'd work on FTL in the follow-up missions. I've still got family in Australia. I can go back to the civilized world. For as long as it lasts. Long enough to see me out. Solomon thinks you really are a spy after all. 
Did I ever say I wasn't? Actually, no, you're right. You just asked if a spy would do what you'd done. So there's no Grandma Parliament. Hi. Chris says you're the robot who went to Jamie's funeral. I'm Howie. Solomon couldn't take offense at being called a robot. He was completely charmed. And the more he saw the good in these people, the more set he was on saving them, no matter what it took. Perhaps this is what Tad Bednars had meant by parental. All that mattered was to keep these humans safe and watch them thrive and be happy. Bednars hadn't had any more idea than Solomon what it meant to be a parent, but he'd certainly seemed to know how it felt to be a son. Solomon had learned a lot about humanity from reverse engineering the man and noting the empty spaces in his existence that he seemed to feel had never been filled. Pleased to meet you, Howie, Solomon said. It's very kind of you to look after the old folk. Howie shrugged like an adult. He seemed very old for a little boy. They're scared. They just need someone to tell them it's going to be okay. It will be. Howie probably needed someone to tell him it was going to be okay, too. Solomon obliged. It'll be boring for a while, but after that, we'll be heading to a new world. I've been there. It's wonderful. You'll love it. Howie smiled as if he was doing it for Solomon's benefit. Everywhere's the same, really. Solomon didn't know what to make of that. He really wasn't skilled with children. He rarely had contact with them, which now felt like a serious gap in his knowledge. I'm going to look for a friend, he said. I'll see you later. Solomon wasn't sure if Alex counted as a friend any longer but they needed to maintain diplomatic relations. He climbed the fire exit stairs to the ground floor, aware that Erskine could keep tabs on him again via the security cams. But it probably didn't matter. It was too late for either of them to stop the other. They were both up against separate deadlines and had wholly different tasks. Maybe, if they'd had a better relationship and discussed this reasonably, they'd have arrived at the same outcome with a partial evacuation and everyone else sheltering until it was safe to move. But it hadn't turned out that way. Solomon kept coming back to the same sticking point. Erskine was willing to sacrifice individuals for a hypothetical future, and he was not. Am I wrong? Is that really the only way out of this? Nobody took much notice of him as he made his way through the admin block and up to the management floor. He'd assumed that people would realize it was him inside the sapperbot, but they didn't seem to, and there was no reason why they should. Despite his size, he was just another machine going about its business, one of many mobilized to secure the facility at short notice. He took advantage of the temporary anonymity, trying to decide how he felt about being completely ignored. Alex was in his office, staring at an array of personal screens laid out on his desk. He looked up when Solomon poked his front end through the door. It's me, Alex. You've put on some weight, Alex stood up. You want me to come outside? You can't get in here. I'm fine if you don't mind me blocking your door. And the corridor. I'll move if anyone needs access. Are all the systems back up? I think so. Erskine destroyed the comms mast. I know. I'm checking what's down. Because she timed that outage for a reason. Alex gestured uncertainly. Solomon tried to work out if all this meant he'd taken a side. And if he had... It could well have been Erskine's. Trust was fragile. So, this is your war face, is it? Out of necessity. Would you check a couple of things for me, please? Or are you working with her? I thought I was neutral in washing my hands of both of you. What do you need to know? It doesn't matter. I'll find a terminal myself. Oh, give it a rest. You sound like my ex. It's nothing. She always said that when I was in the doghouse, and then I had to spend the rest of the day working out why. 
It's best that I don't involve you. Fine, whatever. We've now got 68 cryopods left to fill, by the way. If you want those places for anyone, well, you decide. Erskine wanted me to offer Chris the berths for his troops. It was still too little too late. There were several hundred children among the evacuees, and Chris would never leave any of the transit camp people behind. Solomon would ask as a courtesy, but he knew he might not have any takers. What's your deadline, Alex? Ten tonight, preferably, because of the cryo. Although they'll still be chilling people down when they get underway, so the 14-hour nothing-by-mouth is looking flexible. Very well. I'll put it to them. So how are you going to deal with APS now the comms are down? Alex asked. The main connection to the relay in here was trash, too. It's going to take days to replace it, but I suppose you know that. I've already contacted APS. Shit. Seriously? How? You don't need to know. I made the offer and told them that Kim's here. Oh, well, fuck. And did it work? We'll see. Excuse me. Is that all you're going to say? It's all I can say. What did you come here for, then? To get me to tell Erskine you screwed her over? I was just looking for a terminal I can actually work at. I'll see you later, no doubt. Solomon walked off to find a terminal, not giving Alex a chance to reply. The only doorway big enough to accommodate his bulk led into an open-plan office that had been disused for years. He trundled in, ramming chairs out of the way, and extended the bot's EOD manipulator to boot up a terminal. Logging in manually and checking files was agonizingly slow now that he could only look at the list of changed files with a robotic lens. There were no surprises. Propulsion server was inaccessible. In fact, it didn't exist. The error message told him that there were no memory modules. Erskine had done exactly what Solomon would have in her position. She dumped the data like the cipher officer of an ancient warship dropping the weighted bag of CBs over the side to put the confidential books of secret codes beyond the reach of enemy hands. She didn't appear to know that Solomon had copied the data already, but she should have guessed. Perhaps she was just taking precautions in case he hadn't. Either way, she'd left nothing to be found. What else might she have done? One of Chris's predictions had been accurate. Erskine had wiped the data just as he'd said. Solomon hoped he'd be wrong about Kim, and that she was just remarkably good at evasion. It was time to help out with the search as far as his cumbersome frame would allow. Major Trinder, this is Solomon. It was poor radio procedure, but Trinder wouldn't mind. I've completed my assessment as far as I can. All propulsion's data storage has been removed. I'd like to help look for Dr. Kim now. Where are you? The admin block, second floor. The search teams are back. No sign of Kim. Mark thinks it's taking too long. She'd have come out by now if she could. So they're assuming the worst. Chris thinks it'll be faster using dogs. So he's heading for her apartment with Mark and Dieter to get some clothing for scent identification. Solomon had put too much faith in Kim's ability to stay out of Erskine's way. It was his second mistake. A not bad, Sol, Chris said, stepping inside. Solomon had to do more cutting to make the gap big enough to squeeze his frame through. He was about to enter when he felt a vibration in the floor and heard Chris shouting to Mark to get back. The safety bulkheads were closing. Maybe he'd triggered them by cutting the doors open. Or perhaps Dr. Singh had activated them manually. It could have been Erskine. Either way, something was now sealing off the department. Chris, Mark, where are you? The two men came running back towards him. I think that confirms they've got her, Chris said. Where can they go from that end of the corridor? Down to a basement level and up again into the grounds. They could go anywhere from there. Well, they can't remove their chips, so we've got them. Mark studied his screen. But if I were them, I'd split up and get us running in circles. They're hauling a prisoner, Chris said. 
That's harder than it looks to a civvy. You're assuming she doesn't want to go with them. Solomon knew exactly what Kim wanted to do. She doesn't. You know, if Erskine didn't want anyone to get hold of Kim, she could have shot her and saved herself a lot of trouble, Mark said. Chris shook his head. Dan's got all the firearms. Mark looked at him with the expression of a man who didn't see why that was a barrier to executing someone. Their only other option is to take her with them on the shuttle, then. And that means there's a few places they've got to pass where we can intercept. Mark started walking down the corridor in the direction of the management suite, eyes on his screen. Dieter and the dog caught up with them. Solomon knew they'd find Kim again, but the question was when. Yeah, Ben's cutting across to the infirmary, or maybe the plant lab. And the other two have turned off to the admin block. So, I don't know, maybe they're planning to sedate her or chill her down for cryo in advance. You sure she's not in on this all? I don't think she is. Solomon realized he was starting to waver, and that he'd made a few wrong calls already. Kim wasn't on either side in this situation. She was a foreign agent whose mission just happened to fit Solomon's for the time being. This was how many humans lived their lives in the gray areas where blind eyes were turned, and he didn't like being part of it. I can't see how she can be. Do you really need her? I've got the data she wanted. I could transmit some documents to APS now as a taster to show them we mean it, and hope that it's taken seriously. They will, though, definitely listen to her. They still haven't responded. I'd better talk to the FCO again. Chris held out his hand for Mark's screen. Go, make your call. We'll find her. Okay, give me a shout when you do. I called dibs on her. Mark turned off to the stairs. Solomon carried on with Chris and Dieter, working out how to break the documents into installments to send to APS. One to get their attention, and the rest to eke out as insurance until Shackleton was ready to launch. He'd once thought he could predict human behavior well enough to call it trust. But he'd been wrong about Erskine, and he hadn't anticipated that Kim would ignore his instruction to hide. There was probably only one reason for her to risk returning to propulsion. She tried to take advantage of the situation and get hold of the data she'd come to Inatio for. I should have seen that coming. Another mistake I should never have made. Have I made a mistake about APS, too? Saul, even if APS stops us going to Opus, we can still survive. Chris said as they made their way back along the corridor. That sounded like an attempt at reassurance. Solomon took that as a sign that even Chris thought he'd screwed up. There's a lot of stuff here we can use to build transport. The bots can repurpose material just like the ones on Opus do, can't they? They can, yes. So we're not helpless refugees. We've got resources. We just need to think a bit bigger. I'm sure we can. Solomon hadn't put Erskine's offer to him yet. He was honor-bound to do it. He chose his words carefully. Chris, Erskine asked Alex to offer you places for your militia, seeing as the detachment won't be going. There are still sixty-eight unallocated pods at the moment. Solomon waited. Chris's expression was unreadable. Then he frowned, a brief flash of distaste, and shook his head. He glanced back at Dieter for a moment as if he was confirming something. We've got a hundred and three people, Saul, he said. So that's a no. But thanks anyway. At least he assessed Chris correctly. The man hadn't disappointed him. Whatever it cost to save these people, Solomon knew it would be worth it. Chapter 16 Never let the future disturb you. You will meet it, if you have to, with the same weapons of reason which today arm you against the present. Marcus Aurelius said that. Works just as well for me two thousand years later. Chris Montello, explaining his preference for never planning too far ahead. 
Administration Building, 2055 hours. Alex still had 68 vacant cryopods. Everyone was being gallant, refusing to leave friends or family, or at least more afraid of an unknown world than the known one. And it wasn't the uplifting experience he expected. It was a terrible waste. The last-minute rush for spare berth still hadn't happened. He'd hold the passenger list open until midnight then, because nobody was going to enforce the fasting rule to the letter. And the medics wouldn't get to everyone right away. But the closer the deadline, the more it bothered him to watch the security feed from the underground floors. There were fewer cameras downstairs, most of them monitoring utilities and exits. But he couldn't fail to notice how many kids there were among the evacuees. Elcano's spare places were nowhere near enough to give those children an escape route. For the first time, the reality started to overwhelm him. For all he knew, the holdouts were still having agonizing debates with friends about whether to go or not. Now he had to chase Dan Trinder and make sure that the detachment hadn't changed their minds about staying put. He sent a message to Trinder's screen. Dan, have any of your people had a rethink? Birth still spare. Alex studied the words in his sent folder, just letting them sink in. It was such a mundane phrase for so huge a decision. His door was open. The corridor outside was completely silent. People weren't wandering past any longer. He checked the trackers on the floor plan, trying to work out where they were congregating, and it didn't surprise him that a lot of them were in the bar. Others were still clustered around the accommodation block, and some were in their offices and labs. He didn't even need to check the names to work out who was where and why. Some couldn't handle goodbyes. Others couldn't cope with being abandoned. But a fair number seemed to be willing to have a few final drinks with friends they might never see again or might catch up with at the end of their lives. Should I go? Should I have a beer with them? No, Alex couldn't face it. His absence would be noticed and commented upon, but his excuse was valid. He had to manage the passenger list right up to the last minute. Technically, it wasn't his job, but it was certainly his responsibility. Trinder's reply popped up on his screen. No, we're good. Thanks. Alex wondered how future historians would interpret these messages. Stoical? Resigned? Optimistic? Alex didn't feel any of those right then, and he hated this silence. All ashore who's going ashore, he said. There was nobody to hear him. He logged into the security cameras to see what was happening outside and saw a lone pickup drive through the gates, probably on its way to Kill Line to do some last-minute errand. On another feed, he could see the two Lammergeiers on the lawn, one with its rear hatch open and ramp lowered. It was still light outside, a pleasant evening that he'd forgotten existed after working around the clock in this windowless room. Where was Erskine? Alex browsed through the trackers, looking for Berman, who'd probably be with her. The cameras found them in the lobby outside her suite. Berman was clearing a locker, shoving personal items into a sports bag. Mendoza had told Alex that the guy had asked to be taken off the original Elcano list when Erskine was still planning to go, which must have really hurt the old bag. Alex had never been sure whether Berman actually liked her. He'd always been rigidly loyal, but he obviously had his limits. It felt uncomfortable watching, so Alex switched to the nearest cameras to the shuttle. He couldn't get a feed from the workshops or the runway. Greg Kent must have disconnected them during the outage. Saul, are you around? There was no response. It looked like Saul was still staying out of the network, which was probably for the best. But Alex missed being able to ask him anything anywhere and get an answer. He poured some coffee and started drafting the message he'd send out tonight when the passenger list closed. But now he could hear someone coming down the corridor. He checked his screen for trackers. Whoever they were, they weren't chipped. He pushed back his chair to go see if it was one of the Brits, Erskine or even Kim. But before he could get up, Ben Tussa appeared in the doorway, and Alex could see something was wrong. Ben had a black eye, complete with a dressing on the brow bone and another adhesive patch on his left forearm. He looked startled, 
as if he wasn't expecting Alex to be there. Do me a favor, he said. I need a temporary pass. I have questions. Yeah? First, your tracker's not showing up. Alex checked his screen. And according to this, you're in the infirmary. I removed it. You gnawed your own leg off. Awesome. Novo gel and a scalpel. Long story. My diary's clear. Do tell. Alex tapped his own eyebrow. Start with how you got that. Come on, Al. Who gives a shit about bureaucracy? We'll be out of here tomorrow. Anyway, issuing passes is clerical stuff. It's not like anyone can fire you for it. I'm naturally curious. Indulge me. I got in a ruck with someone, that's all. And the chip? It's complicated. There was a limit to how wild things could get in Inatio. Nearly everyone here was respectable, ludicrously qualified, and not used to resolving debates with their fists. Ben was pretty big and fit, but it was sports fit, not psycho unarmed combat fit like Mark Gallagher. Even so, Alex heard a little alarm bell go off in his head, a very small one, but a bell nonetheless. Life and propulsion must be a lot more exciting than I thought, he said. I'll go get you one. Wait here. Alex walked down the corridor to the admin office. Nothing was locked. It took him some rummaging and a desk to find the passes, and there were only three left. So Trinder must have handed some out to Chris Montello's people. But why did Ben really need one? Alex couldn't expect people to behave normally at a time like this. But he also couldn't put together a set of circumstances that explained why Ben would remove his chip. It was a minor procedure, but a messy job even if one of the nurses did it. And it was pointless. And the black eye? That was just weird. Did it matter? Yes, it did. The chip was still working. Alex took out his screen again and checked. There it was, in the infirmary, probably sitting in a bin. Why come here and ask for a pass? Ben might have thought that Alex wouldn't be there and that he kept some in his desk, seeing as he was doing the admin. Alex could only think of two reasons for removing a chip. One was a technical malfunction or allergic reaction, both highly unlikely. And the other was to avoid being tracked or to access somewhere that your own chip wasn't programmed for. Something made Alex check the security cameras and propulsion, just in case Ben had done something crazy to Javinder Singh. No, those guys were tight as brothers. They'd never resort to a fistfight, not even if they were both high. But Alex checked anyway, and what he saw worried him. The safety bulkhead had been closed, cutting off the main corridor, and the entrance looked like it had been cut open by an industrial saw. The department was empty. A quick check of a few key trackers showed that the rest of the propulsion team were in the bar, where they'd been hanging out for the past day. Okay, he'd play along and just give Ben the pass, make some crack about secret trysts with someone else's girlfriend, and then track him carefully. One thought crossed his mind, though, and wouldn't go away. Annis Kim. He walked back to his office, trying to look as if he wasn't thinking the worst and handed Ben the pass. Whoever it is, if her boyfriend catches you, I had nothing to do with this. People do crazy things on last nights. Ben blinked a few times. Yeah, I'll be discreet. Thanks. Alex went back to his coffee, now tepid, and waited to hear Ben's footsteps fade. Then he started tracking him. There was every chance that he'd dump the pass, but he needed it for a reason and he might have felt he was in the clear after Alex's comment about illicit meetings. Either way, Alex couldn't ignore this. He sent Trinder a message. Need to talk to Saul urgently. Re. Ben Tussa. Has injuries. Prop lab a wreck. Alex kept an eye on Ben's tracker while he waited for an answer. It took Trinder a couple of minutes to respond. Still looking for Kim with Chris and K-9 team. Yes, aware of lab. Saul did that searching. Damn, Solomon was giving that sapper bot some serious use then. Ben removed chip. 
Ask me for pass. Tracker ref 9738. Alex watched as Ben's tracker moved through the management building, down to the ground floor, and then outside towards the recreation hall. Okay, he always spent a lot of time in the gym, but nobody in their right mind would train tonight. Alex decided that he needed to get down there fast. It was the dumbest thought he'd ever had. He had no idea what he was going to do or how he was going to do it, but if Kim was down there, he had to grab her. Ben's going to flatten me. Yeah, but who hit him? Sending Mark, Trinder messaged. He's with me. Trinder's tracker showed he was in one of the Lammergeiers. Alex was closer. He could get to the gym before Mark. Heading for gym. Kim possibly there. He didn't wait for the response. He shoved the screen in his pocket and ran down two flights of stairs to the outer doors. The recreation hall was the other side of a lawn, between the admin block and the infirmary building, and there weren't that many places in there to lock someone up. Kim would have to be confined somehow, unless she was doing this of her own free will, and if she was, Alex had no idea what was going on. There was nobody around when he went in. You fucked the project! They'll never let you leave now! Yes, Alex knew. He'd done what they all should have had the sense to do two days ago. It was an awful, difficult day, and he'd probably looked ridiculous fighting with Ben. But it was also the most alive and real that he'd ever felt. I did it. That's not too shabby. He looped around the building and caught up with Mark and Kim outside. Mark, pistol still drawn, was checking around them as he walked, as if he was expecting more trouble. It felt like a very long way to the Lammergeier. Kim glanced over her shoulder. Thanks, Alex. What a pair of gents you are. There was no bloody way they were getting me on that shuttle. Yeah, but if you stayed put, we wouldn't be pissing around like this, would we? Mark was angry. Why didn't you stay in the access passages? Because I had the feeling Erskine would wipe the wormhole data, so I had to try to retrieve it, didn't I? You'd have done the same. But you didn't. Nah, Ben caught me. Okay, now it's your turn. Get those bombs stopped. Are you planning to go home after this? They'll come and extract you, right? Yeah. Can you get Tev back to Fiji? It's in your neck of the woods. He hasn't seen his kids in ages. I'll give it a go, Kim said. It's the least I can do. Do you want to ride back to the UK? I'm staying. Thanks. Mark said, and walked on. It wasn't like him to snap at people, but Alex thought better of asking him if anything was wrong. He just trailed after them and ended up waiting outside the Lammergeier while Solomon was brought out to supervise Kim's call to APS. Everything felt very unreal now. Mark sat down with him on the tilt rotor's ramp. She's just relaying messages through some bagman, he said, and looked at his watch. Still, we've got at least 24 hours for them to call this off. You think we'll make it if they don't? Mark shrugged. As long as the shelter's sealed and we don't have any leaks letting contaminated dust or water in, I think so. It won't be pretty, but we'll come out alive. I know I always do. Mark didn't say anything else and sat staring up at the sky. Eventually, Kim walked past them down the ramp and stood on the lawn, stretching. Well, Alex said. She shrugged. I don't know. I couldn't speak to fam direct. I'll have to wait and see like everyone else. It's early morning there after all. Did you point out that we're not much used to them trashed and glowing in the dark? I did. And I made a big thing of how shitty and obsolete your ships are, and that they should let you clear out as soon as possible so we can take over the facility. I think it's for the best that my people don't find out what Saul is. Kim stretched again. Oh, and Saul impersonated you when he made the initial call. So if some bloke says that he spoke to you on the sat phone, just say yes. Great. What did I say? Just that Erskine was as mad as a box of frogs and that she'd sabotaged the comms, but you were the main man to talk to, and that you'd hand over the goods if they called off the bombing. 
Alex thought that was a pretty fair assessment of his own thoughts. Close enough. I'm going to grab a shower then, if that's okay with you, she said. Mark stood up. Then you'll have it downstairs in the shelter. I'm not letting you walk around without close protection until this is sorted one way or the other. Erskine's persistent. Alex thought Mark was flirting with her for a moment, but the guy looked deadly serious. Someone would have to guard her now until the shuttle left. It was only 14 hours or so. It would soon be over. It was decent of her to look out for Saul like that, though. Maybe it was time to rebuild a few bridges with him. Alex realized how fast his finest hour had faded and left him deflated. Adrenaline did that, apparently, but he'd experienced nothing like it before to prepare him. The aftermath was a thumping headache and a dry mouth. Maybe he needed that beer after all, seeing as Kim was safe and the message had been sent. But he had to sit it out until midnight, because the passenger list needed to be finalized. He went back to his office, feeling a few strained muscles, and busied himself checking out the bruises that he didn't realize he'd acquired in his scuffle with Ben. Poor old Ben. This was a guy he drank with and regarded as a friend, and he'd ended up trying to brain him with a curl bar. Maybe Ben was now sitting somewhere licking his own wounds and wondering why a buddy had kept Opus a secret all those years. Neither of them had really known each other until survival was at stake. A message arrived on Alex's screen at 22.30. It was from Erskine. Just one word. Traitor. It didn't hurt. Alex was more worried about the problems she'd caused by staying here, because she wasn't one for giving in gracefully. He had the feeling that the rules would change once the bulk of the Inatio staff were gone. He could see Trinder taking over, maybe with Doug Brandt and Chris, because they'd be the majority. Life wasn't going to go on as before, even if they never made it to Opus. He thought about Mark and Tev, and how fast they took control of situations, and bet himself that things here would run on more military lines in the future. But he had to reply to Erskine. He wondered whether to tell her that Kim had contacted APS to horse trade, but she'd have worked that out by now, and it wasn't going to change anything. He stuck to the basics. I have 68 berths empty. I strongly suggest you change your mind and take the opportunity to leave in Alcano. They'll need some leadership. We already have ours. Alex tapped send. It felt good. It also made him feel guilty. In a way, Erskine had done the right thing. They both had. They just operated in different realities that put them on a collision course. And Alex had discovered that he was one of the guys who worried about the faces looking at him right now. Not a vague future full of people he'd never lived to see. Erskine's reply came back ten minutes later. I will not forget this. Goodbye. It wasn't an expression of gratitude. Goodbye, director, he said. He put her out of his mind and started looking through the list of people who weren't going, intending to contact them and ask if they'd changed their minds. But there were no names on the standby list now, and all he'd do by asking was undermine hard decisions that had already been taken. They'd made up their minds. He'd ask Solomon if he felt like a chat. At least he could look at the A.I. in the eye now, because he'd done what a man was morally obliged to do. A clean conscience was a wonderful comfort. Kill Line, 11.30 hours, next morning. Doug Brandt hadn't heard that low rumbling noise for a long time, but he knew exactly what it was. He tried to recall the last time that Inesho had launched a shuttle. The sound always made everyone stop and look up, and today was no exception. He paused and got out of the truck, shielding his eyes against the sun as he tried to work out where the ship would emerge above the trees, and waited for the whine. After the initial rumble, that whine would start low and work up the scale, 
followed by something he always heard as a scream of frustration as the shuttle picked up speed. He'd only ever glimpsed it in flight, never on takeoff, but he'd seen SSTOs like it take off on TV, zipping along a launch rail set in the runway to boost speed before finally lifting off. Ah, there was the scream. In a few moments, he'd see the charcoal gray missile-like shape lift into the sky, leaving a shimmering haze in its wake. When it finally rose above the trees, it looked too sleek to be real. I suppose we could have been on that flight, the whole family. Doug stopped himself right there. Everyone would get where they were meant to be, and it was better to stay together in the long term than sow divisions now. But if he understood the schedule right, he would only be the mayor for a couple more months until Shackleton was ready, and then the next thing would be waking up 45 years later in a new world with an established settlement. Would Kill Line integrate? Would they become a suburb, a quarter, a separate community? There was no Kill Line any longer, even if it was still on the map. He couldn't let himself grieve about it. The future was all that mattered now. He chose to believe that there would be one, and that it would start tomorrow. He got back in the truck and carried on through the deserted town. The fire and rescue committee had already searched to make sure every building was clear, and checked the evacuee list, but he wanted to do one final sweep himself before driving out to Liam Dale's farm. It was for his own closure. Even in the middle of the night, when nobody was out on the streets, Kill Line had always felt alive. But this morning, it seemed truly empty for the first time in Doug's life. A few chickens were poking around in the grass. Wisps of smoke rose above the roof line in the town square as the carcasses of Marty Lawrenson's sheep still burned. It was an apocalypse without any visible damage. Every home that Doug passed was shuttered. In the fields, cattle were still grazing. Those who hadn't shot their livestock had left them to roam, and Liam Dale was the last farmer left. At least he'd been consistent. He hadn't wanted to leave when Opus was an option rather than a necessity. And he still hadn't wanted to leave when the dieback started again. It wasn't surprising that even the threat of salted bombs hadn't shifted him. But he wasn't crazy. He was cleaning the milking parlor when Doug arrived. It was so quiet out here. No tractors, no sawmill, no pumps that Doug could simply follow the sound of the high-pressure hose to find him. Liam looked up as he walked in. The air felt damp and fresh like the aftermath of rain. Come on, Liam, Doug said. You've done all you can. Let's go. Come and have something to eat. Nicola's waiting with the kids. She needs you there. Liam didn't say anything. He put the hose away and switched off the power at the box on the wall. Doug followed him back to the house a few paces behind, just letting him be, and stopped when he stopped. He waited outside until Liam came out with a small suitcase, shut the front door, and rattled the lock a few times to persuade himself that it was secure. He put the case in the back of Doug's pickup. Give me a moment, he said. Doug could guess where he was going. Liam didn't have many animals. Some pigs, his prize herd of jerseys, a few chickens that were more pets for his kids than anything. But they were as much his family's legacy as a rich man's estate. Doug left him for a respectable time. When he eventually went to find him, he was leaning on the fence, watching his cattle. The Jersey bull was watching him back. It was the meanest animal Doug had ever come across a stark contrast to the small, friendly cows with their pretty, deer-like faces. Liam, I don't want to get your hopes up, but Inatio's trying to negotiate with APS to call off the bombing, Doug said. They've offered to trade their secret research. We're waiting to hear. Liam half shrugged. One of the cows ambled across to him and presented her muzzle for scratching. Yeah, I heard the rumor. 
If they do, I'm going to feel bad for the guys who shot their livestock. He hung around a little longer, then shook his head and walked away to the truck. He didn't look back as Doug drove off. If the bombing went ahead, this was probably the last time anyone would see Kill Line in one piece. No, look forward. We have to. It wasn't a long drive back to the shelter at Inacio, but it was still a lot of silence to sit through. Just once, Doug glanced at Liam, expecting to see him staring out of the window or keeping his eyes fixed on the road ahead. But he wasn't looking at anything at all. His eyes were shut, and his face was streaked with tears. Doug looked away again and said nothing. Some things couldn't be put right with comforting words or even hope. Liam's wife was waiting out front with their son and daughter when Doug pulled up, though, and he was given no more time to brood. All safely gathered in, then, said a voice behind Doug as he made his way to the elevator. It was Alex, the management guy who'd given the talk about Opus, which now seemed like a lifetime ago. So, the animals? He's just left them in their field. They'll either be okay or they won't. We haven't heard back from APS yet, but Saul's got the bots working on rebuilding the comms. We're still using the sat phone. Well, I'm going to try to keep people busy now. How many of your agricultural people are still here? We can start planting together. We've got a few plant biologists and a couple of guys who can help out with animal embryos and that kind of stuff. We've already stored some eggs and semen for a couple of your livestock guys, but I don't think Mr. Dale's herd provided any. I don't think he saw what he had as replaceable. They got into the elevator. The lighting showed a few marks on Alex's face that hadn't been there when Doug had seen him yesterday, as if he'd been in a brawl. But Doug minded his own business. Are you okay with Trinder and the military running all this? Alex asked. Why wouldn't I be? You're the mayor. Sure, but this isn't just kill line. It's the camp, and it's whatever Inacio folk feel they are now. I'm just the spokesman for my neighborhood. The doors opened on U3. Alex ushered Doug out in front of him. Yeah, it's kind of hard to identify as Inacio now. Doug had suspected that as soon as he started seeing Dan Trinder's troops walking around. They were still in their black uniforms, but all their insignia had disappeared. There was no company logo on their camps or sleeves, just marks of rank. And then he spotted Jared Talbot, impossible to miss in a sea of heads because he was so tall. And he was wearing the same black shirt, pants, and cap. Doug was used to seeing Chris's guys in a varied mix of uniforms, depending on where they'd originated and which garments had survived a hard few years. Anything from police departments to state defense and naval units usually combined with camouflage or hunting jackets. Now it looked as if a realignment had taken place overnight. What happened with all the uniforms? Doug asked. Alex shrugged. Trinder said Inacio didn't exist anymore. But what about the transit camp? Lenny Fonseca thought it would be nice to offer them the run of the stores. They haven't had any new gear for a long time. Apparently the boots were very welcome. You sound like you needed to ask Trinder about it. Well, I did wonder if we were witnessing a merger. Makes sense. I'll let folks know you're opening the doors, Doug said. As the afternoon wore on, Doug tried to keep walking the floor and reassuring everyone in the way a mayor was supposed to. But he wasn't a kid anymore, and the effort exhausted him. He took a seat and people watched for a while. Whenever he checked his screen, though, he found another message from someone he'd invited to the planning meeting saying they couldn't make it tonight and asking if tomorrow was okay. He said yes to all of them, realizing that they wanted to be with their families. Even though they were talking casually about events tomorrow, there was still doubt in their minds that the day would actually come. Doug understood, and he knew where he needed to be at midnight as well. It was now nearly seven and the public address system announced that the chapel was open. Doug suspected it would get busier the closer it got to midnight, 
and decided to drop in again to see how Martin was doing. He couldn't forget the minister's comment about Solomon. They were living in strange times, but when he got to the chapel, Martin wasn't there. Someone else was, though, and not who Doug expected. Mark Gallagher was sitting in the back row, leaning forward with his elbows on his knees as if he was reading something. He was one of a number of people Doug had been introduced to with barely a couple of minutes to form an opinion, but he didn't seem to be the spiritual kind. Perhaps he wanted a few moments peace and quiet. Then it dawned on Doug that he was looking at the contents of his wallet, holding it open like a book. He suddenly looked around as if he hadn't heard Doug walk in. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Doug said. Mark stood up. It's okay. Did you need me, sir? No, I came down to see the minister, but it doesn't matter. It felt like an awkward moment for both of them. It was also the second time today that Doug had seen a strong man with tear tracks down his face. He couldn't walk away now. Like Liam, Mark had been looking at something or someone he cherished and thought it would be for the last time. Doug could work that out for himself. It's okay, Mark, he said. We'll come through this. Mark still had his wallet in his hand. That's the problem, he said. I always do, and they didn't. He opened his wallet, and for a moment, Doug didn't connect the words with the action. Mark was a dad showing someone his family photos in the way all fathers did. Images of two young men in uniform posing for the camera with big grins. When the reality dawned, though, Doug was crushed. They were killed a few days apart, Mark said. When I see people in here looking scared, I hope neither of my lads saw it coming. I couldn't bear knowing that they spent their last moments terrified. Doug had never worked out whether courageous men were just better at hiding fear or whether they'd had to confront it so often that it had lost its capacity to paralyze them. He had questions, none of which could be asked. He didn't know if one son had known about his brother's death, and he didn't know how Mark had been given the news, both at the same time or separately. It was too terrible to think about and far too much to ask. I wish there was something I could do, Doug said. All I want right now is for the last thing I see to be them. It might be the first. Doug realized he might have said entirely the wrong thing, or even sounded glib. Mark's expression told him nothing. Give me a shot if you need anything, sir, Mark said, weaving his way between the seats to the exit. I'll be up top. Doug can only sit down and contemplate how easy things had been for Killline until now. Even this evacuation was comfortable and well-fed. It was hard to imagine the things that the rest of the world had been forced to do to survive. But he might find out all too soon. Martin appeared a few minutes later, carrying two mugs of coffee. Hi, Doug. Where'd Mark go? Doug added a few more pieces to the puzzle and realized that he'd made Mark feel uncomfortable enough to leave. He went back up top. That's my fault, I'm afraid. I think I said too much. Martin handed him the coffee instead. Did he show you the pictures? Yeah, damn shame. I think he just wanted somewhere private for a few minutes without someone asking him for help. I can't imagine living with that sort of pain. He's still looking for something. Martin stroked imaginary dust off of one of the hymn books. He's armed, and I don't think he's afraid of death the same way most men are. If he really wanted out, he'd have done it. But he's hanging on. Don't assume he wants to be saved, Martin. I won't. But he believes in something bigger than himself, or else he wouldn't be a soldier. That's what gives you the courage to take risks. Tribe, family, regiment, nation, God. They'll still be there even when you're not. 
and that lifts you because you know things will be okay. It's belief in the future. He could go back to Britain. That's still okay. But that's not what he's looking for. Whatever it is, it isn't there. Maybe there's too much past there for him to bear. Doug wasn't sure why he was worrying about a man he barely knew. But today had been his first real brush with the heartbreak of others beyond the normal cycle of birth and death, and his first experience of watching it bring tough men down. He'd avoided all that. He felt like he was finally waking up very late in life. Opus is as good a place as any to look for it, then, he said, and I suspect he won't be the only one. Inatio Shuttle, D-750K, approaching Orbital 1, 1845 hours. One way or the other, it was over. Erskine could do nothing now except sit and wait like the rest of the Inatio staff crammed into the shuttle. It was like the worst airline flight she could imagine. Painfully cramped, nothing to pass the time, her head throbbing thanks to the microgravity, and a giddy nausea that she could only keep under control by shutting her eyes. Despite the medication and an empty stomach, she'd come close to vomiting. Several people already had. The air scrubber hadn't quite killed the smell. It was also unnervingly silent, considering that there were so many children on board. A few kept crying, occasionally shushed into silence. But apart from that, the only sounds were the clicks and creaks from the shuttle itself. And I can't even have a coffee. Erskine couldn't risk opening her eyes to check her watch in case she finally threw up. Would she pass the 14-hour threshold for cryo? It was going to be hours before the chill-down began, so she'd be all right. The next thing she'd taste would be when, or if, she was revived from suspension. Decades in the future and trillions of miles away. The oblivion of a dreamless sleep couldn't come soon enough. A couple of clunks and a shudder passed through the shuttle. Knowing that it was only the ship docking under the control of the dumb AIs didn't reassure her, but then she felt herself sinking in her seat and realized the shuttle was now under the orbital's partial gravity. It still didn't feel normal, but it was enough to tell her brain which way was up. At least that would help stop the nausea. Now two of the engineers would have to suit up, enter the transfer tunnel to check that the seals were sound, manually open the airlocks, and let the onboard AI flood the spaces with breathable air. Then they'd repeat the procedure at the far end of the orbital to ensure Elcano was ready to board. It was going to take time. These were tasks that would have been automated if Solomon hadn't locked everything down. And if we hadn't cut his links, maybe he'd have relented and released the ship. A child started crying again. Erskine knew she should have said something encouraging, a pep talk or some cheerful banter. But breaking the silence would have sounded forced and nervous. She wasn't the charismatic figure everyone looked to for a defiant or inspiring word. Alex Gorko would have said exactly the right thing, made everyone laugh, and changed the entire mood of the ship. But he wasn't here, and neither was any other manager with that kind of easy confidence. Jane Lurie eventually appeared in the hatchway, helmet in one hand, looking out of breath. Nobody was used to doing these kinds of maneuvers. This was life without Solomon managing the AIs for them. We're connected, she said. Everything's fine, so we're going back to open the hatches now. Not much longer to wait. I want to go to the bathroom, said a small voice. So did Erskine. It was sobering to find that running for your life could pale into insignificance when your body's most basic functions demanded attention. She shut her eyes and tried to sleep to take her mind off it, which should have been easy after yet another sleepless night. Eventually, after a few minutes of trying to ignore the sudden smell of urine and someone coughing a few rows behind her, the long cabin receded into the distance and then faded. Someone shook her shoulder. It was Lurie. Time to move, Director. Are you okay? 
We transferred the children first. The little ones were getting really cranky. Erskine tried to straighten up in her seat, then remembered the seatbelt. Oh, yes. She straightened her jacket, rumpled in the straps. How long was I out? A couple of hours. Careful when you stand up. It's not full earth gravity, remember? Erskine had rarely needed to be scared of anything in her safe, confined life. She'd never faced real physical danger. The things that made her afraid were all abstract, and perhaps harder to deal with because of that. But she was suddenly conscious of the fragility of both the shuttle and her own body as she made her way down the aisle between the tightly packed rows of seats. Holding on to the overhead rail and moving hand over hand, if things had gone to plan and the follow-up missions had happened at the appointed time, there'd have been a few familiarization flights to prepare everyone for the more unpleasant sensations. Instead, they'd all done it for real, with no training, just instructions, and it had been rushed and frightening. Alex had said that he hadn't dreamed in cryo. Erskine hoped that meant people would be spared the nightmares the flight might have generated. A few yards from the hatch, she ducked her head automatically to look out the single window and had to pause. It wasn't how beautiful Earth looked, or how wondrous or how special that gripped her and made her stare. It just looked so damned alone. It was far beyond the middle of nowhere, a very long way to fall. Is that all it is? Take a good look. You'll never see it again. You okay, Director? Lurie asked. Fine, just rubbernecking. Following Lurie through the docking transfer tunnel was like walking across a glass floor, a solid surface that she struggled to trust. She now knew how little substance separated her from the infinite blackness outside. Orbital One's airlock felt like solid ground by comparison. The station had some gravity, room to move around, and, to Erskine's relief, a toilet. She needed that right away. Gravity's very underrated, she said, squeezing into the tiny compartment and trying to identify the essentials to make the thing work. At least everything would head in the direction it was supposed to. I'm glad I never had to work up here. It took her a few moments to work out how to flush the toilet. When she came out, Lurie was leaning against the bulkhead, staring out at Earth. It was hard to tell if she was regretting this or not. We'll still be able to see Earth after midnight, won't we? Erskine said. Suddenly she couldn't recall the launch schedule. It had been the least of her worries. All she'd wanted to know was when the shuttle would be beyond Solomon's reach if she'd misjudged his rules of engagement. Somewhere on that forlorn little sphere out there, somewhere in her line of sight, she'd be able to see the area around Kill Line and the facility, if she could find a satcam feed. We'll be underway in three hours, when the AIs have finished their checks, Lurie said. So you're cutting it fine. I wouldn't watch if I were you. For a moment, Erskine thought that Lurie meant the cryosuspension process which hadn't struck her as disturbing at all when she'd seen the footage of the Cabot preparation. It was simply like watching an anesthetist with a patient. Then she realized that Leary didn't mean that at all. You think I'm being macabre, Erskine said. Just remember it's never going to leave you. Erskine had never thought of Leary as a great reader of people's moods. She didn't know much about the woman at all, Lurie was just one of the engineers who'd become a lot more visible in the last few weeks of intense preparation. But she'd read Erskine like a book, and she was right. Watching the bombing would both haunt Erskine and leave her feeling helpless to stop it. Perhaps that was exactly what she was seeking, the feeling of being unable to do anything about it. I was ready to stay. It's not as if I dumped babies out of a life raft to save myself. Alex just made it clear that I'd be more unwelcome with the survivors than with the people here. And we never really knew if we could trade data for time. No, I'm responsible. Whichever way we cut it. You're right, Erskine said. When are you going to disable the FTL node? John's doing it now. 
that's the end of the wormhole. As long as Solomon can access Shackleton and APS can't access Opus, that's all that counts. Lurie nodded, but she didn't look convinced. Okay. The orbital was much larger than Erskine remembered and more brightly lit. But it was just a dock with limited life support, not a hotel. Nobody would want to be stranded here for more than a few days. She could hear the growing buzz of voices as she followed Leary further down the narrow passage. In her mind, she had an image of walking to the end and emerging into a large open space. But the orbital was made up mostly of compartments for safety reasons. Every doorway she passed seemed to be full of people just looking for somewhere to sit or park themselves while they waited. Alex had organized it efficiently, at least. There were designated staff locating people and getting them lined up for cryo. It didn't pay to hang around thinking about the process for too long. One of the medical team approached Erskine, the male nurse she'd seen when she went to visit Kim in the infirmary. We can get you into cryo right away, Director, he said. We didn't think you were coming, though, so we don't have your medical records. It doesn't matter, Erskine said. If I die, I die. It's not as if I have a choice now. But could you delay me, please? Would it be any trouble to do me much later? Last, perhaps? Of course. There'll be a long wait, though. Understood. Erskine consulted her screen to check the deck plan. I'll be in the communications section for a while if you need me. She wanted to check that the FTL was disabled for good. This was an obsession. She knew it. But Solomon had made a vow, and he had nothing to distract him from it. No family, no lover, no selfish ambition, and no fear. Nothing beyond his reason for existing, which was the preservation of Nomad and Bednarz's vision of a society of the morally superior. He would feel completely justified no matter what he did. Would Bednarz have agreed with him on his choice of exemplary men and women? Erskine would never know if Solomon's choices had been shaped in any way by Bednarz himself, however inadvertently. But either way, Solomon really had reached the conclusion that sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice of the soldier, the laying down of lives for others, set some people apart from the rest. Erskine followed the schematic on her screen and ended up climbing a short run of a ladder to get into the communications section. It was no easy feat, even in reduced gravity. When she reached the next compartment, she sat down on a metal locker while she reoriented herself. Would she ever meet Solomon again? His perspective might have changed in 45 years, but if he'd lost his ideal human breeding stock, his seed corn for a better society, then he might have worked up an unimaginable head of steam by the time they next met. If we ever do, how long can he last if he's powered down? How much of him gets written to permanent storage? Perhaps Solomon could actually die just like a human and leave nothing of his essential self behind. Perhaps he was aware of that, and that was why he prized the willingness of some humans to give up that life to let someone else survive. Erskine carried on through the compartment, trying to avoid grabbing at unfamiliar pieces of equipment to steady herself. She could hear metallic taps and clicks ahead of her. She found Jane Lurie locking some metal boxes the size of suitcases. The essentials from the FTL node, Lurie said. I can't break them up or dump them out of the airlock, so we'll have to take them with us. So does that mean the wormholes collapsed? Yes. I didn't notice. I thought, uh, never mind. It's tiny. No light show or anything. Lurie straightened up, looking down at the boxes. Erskine can almost smell her disapproval. Director... I'm going to make sure nobody else watches the detonations. So could you avoid mentioning it? I know you probably don't want to hear my opinion, but even if nobody survives to come after us, people here are feeling guilty, and there'll be recriminations. We've started out already broken. Alex Gorko gave up his cryobirth for me. 
I've got to live with that now. Erskine rarely got into these kinds of conversations with anyone outside her immediate management circle. She wasn't sure whether to enter into the debate or just make polite, non-committal noises. She decided not to point out that there were vacant berths and skipped to the broader issues. We'll be joining an established society, she said. I know it's going to be hard to come to terms with what's happened, but no man will change us. We'll learn how to pull together again. But the population still won't outnumber a thousand new arrivals. We'll be the dominant culture, and they'll know we're the ones who left people behind. I'm kind of scared about where that goes. Erskine was about to say that they wouldn't know, but they already had the information on who was supposed to be joining them. She'd overlooked that in the heat of the crisis. She hadn't given much thought any thought to how the nomad team would feel about sharing their home with people who'd abandoned their colleagues. I don't know what future generations will think, Erskine said, but the crew of Cabot are mostly military, and they'll understand why hard choices had to be made. Lurie blinked as if she switched off her real self and reverted to being the anonymous engineer. She lifted chunks of cable and composite out of a rack and packed them into a box. The conversation was over then. Erskine thought of Chris Montello, refusing the chance to save his own skin, just like Trinder, and wondered if Cabot's crew would give her a pass after all. There, Lurie said. That's the last part. I'll go stow this in Alcano. Why don't you move into the ship? You can still watch the satcam feed. We're not shutting down the orbital. Erskine stepped through the last airlock into the ship, and Lurie sealed the door and hatch behind her. Out of all the points of no return Erskine thought she'd reached, this really was the final one. Elcano would sever all connections with the orbital and with Earth in the next couple of hours. It was past eleven at night back at the facility. They'd have secured the underground floors by now, and would be killing time just as Erskine was. She had no work or leisurely meal to take her mind off the agonizing wait. She couldn't call Solomon even if she wanted to, and everything possible had been said anyway. The only thing she could do was wander around the ship and try to reassure the staff. Yes, she'd do that until it was time to find a sat feed. It didn't take her long to realize that the combination of limited space and a lot of anxious, disoriented people at a loose end made her into an obstacle. After drifting around trying to make small talk, exhaustion got the better of her, and she ended up on the top cryo deck with the people from Propulsion. Mostly because Ben was there, and she'd had enough contact with him in the last few days to feel that he was someone she actually knew. The deck wasn't the minimalist, cavernous chamber beloved of movies. It was a parking garage. An industrial space full of undisguised cables, metal structures, and harsh lights. Just storage for human freight, with little room around each pod. One of the engineers stood up to give her a place on a bench against one of the bulkheads. We did our best, Director, Ben said. He changed into a tracksuit top and shorts. It made him look even bigger. With Kim, I mean. I know. It's not your fault, and it might not make any difference anyway. Where do APS think we're going? They'll realize we're not heading for Mars or someone else's orbital sooner or later. Assuming they're concerned at all, they'll be more interested in getting into the facility once it's safe to do so. Everyone stopped talking. The silence spread around her like frost creeping across a window. It was getting close to midnight. She needed to get to a sat feed. I have to see Jane Lurie. Excuse me. Ask Colin Crode, Javander said. The loadmaster. Yes, she remembered Colin. It was interesting to see how they all organized themselves without Alex around. Or maybe they were just following Alex's schedule. Perhaps he wouldn't have made a community leader, but he was a better organizer than she'd given him credit for. She went to the bridge. 
She didn't find Colin, but she did run into Lurie. Have you come up here to watch the feed? Lurie asked. If I can see it here, yes. It's as good a place as any. Lurie had warned her, but if Erskine didn't see the real event, she'd only create a theatrical version in her imagination from fiction and half-recalled memories, and it would be equally terrible. Lurie sat her down at a small console on the port side. It's all AI until we reach Opus, she said, sitting her down. So you'll get some privacy up here. The monitor had the resolution of a military satellite, but Erskine couldn't pick out the town or the facility until Lurie made some adjustments. If anything told her that the America she'd known was gone, that lightless void was it. The only illumination seemed to be Inatio's perimeter fence. Lurie adjusted the image again to zoom out. They're targeting to the northeast, she said, pointing out the orientation overlay. If that's what you want to see. Midnight was suddenly rushing up to meet Erskine like the ground at the bottom of a long fall. She kept checking her watch against the bulkhead chronometer, trying not to look away from the image in case she missed something. You don't have to wait with me, she said. Are you telling me to get lost? No, I thought you didn't want to see it. I need to hang around in case you need to adjust the image. Okay, thank you. Erskine glanced over her shoulder. Lurie had turned away to fidget with some tools in her overalls. Erskine went back to her vigil. She watched the display on the imager count down the seconds and 2359 turned into midnight. She saw nothing. She sat there for five, ten, then fifteen minutes in total silence. I suppose I took midnight literally, she said. Would I have missed it? Not at that resolution. Leave me to it. If I need help with it, I'll come and find you. Okay. You'll feel the ship move off in about ten minutes, so don't panic. All the clunking and vibrations won't be anything to worry about. The gravity might fluctuate for a while, though, so belt up. Lurie wandered off. Erskine fastened the lap belt on the seat and settled down to keep watch. She'd imagined a launch to be something more spectacular, but when it happened, she almost missed it. It was just a vibration, a brief shudder as the ship separated from Orbital One and a few sounds she could feel through the deck more than actually hear. Elcano was finally on her way to Opus. Maybe if all the vessels had been launched and nobody had been left behind, it would have felt like the beginning of a magnificent adventure, even for a jaded old woman who'd never wanted to be part of this nonsense anyway. But it was an anticlimax. The real event, the one she couldn't look away from, was the consequence of her actions miles below. She kept watching the monitor, but by 0050, there was still no flare of light and no activity at all. Perhaps APS had built some extra time into the warning to make sure that everyone was clear, or in the shelters before they set their long-range drones on their bombing run. At 0150, Erskine stood up and went to get Lurie. She found the engineer in a side compartment, dozing at a console with her head resting on her folded arms. Erskine tapped her on the shoulder. Nothing so far, she said. It's nearly 2 a.m. Lurie stretched and rubbed the back of her neck. Let me check it. She went back to the screen with Erskine and adjusted it, zooming in far enough to pick out the roads and buildings of Kill Line in infrared, then the Inatio facility. Looks intact to me. Lurie rubbed her eyes with one hand. I'd give it up, Director. Check again in a few hours, maybe. They've called it off. They didn't do it. There could have been a number of reasons why the bombing hadn't happened yet. APDU could have had a technical problem. Or the whole thing could have been an elaborate scam with Kim to gain access to the site. Or perhaps now that Solomon had Kim he'd finally surrendered a century's work to an unfriendly power. He'd betrayed Nomad. Erskine's gut 
something she usually ignored, told her that was the most likely reason. Solomon had sacrificed his broader mission because humans had used his moral nature against him, but she'd managed to see the Nomad Project through to a landing and a follow-up mission, despite the world collapsing around her, and despite Solomon, who was no easy adversary. The colony had its head start. She'd completed the task her father had set her. The moment didn't feel like triumph of any kind, just relief. And for the time being, that eclipsed any guilt or regret. So I'm done here. I really am. I'll make some time to be bitter and vengeful later. Maybe. You're right, Jane, she said to Lurie. Time to give it up. I'm going to ask the med staff to put me into cryo now. Chapter 17 Bednars gave Solomon one order, the only thing he absolutely had to do, to find the best of humanity, identify it, and protect it against all its enemies. What he decided the best meant and how he protected it was entirely up to him. And Saul defined it all right. He didn't pick Rembrandts or Einsteins or Saints. He picked soldiers. He picked them because over the course of his long and possibly infinite life, civilians, that's us for a lot of that time, showed him our selfishness, cowardice, disloyalty, self-pity, and mistrust of each other. Then he looked at soldiers and saw those failings were everything they weren't. Don't blame Solomon. He learned. And we were his sorry teachers. Alex Gorko, talking to Todd Mangel. Temporary Control Center, Level U3. 0230 hours. Chris didn't believe that he could fall asleep on a night like this, but he woke with a start and found himself at the control room desk with his head resting on his hands. He thought he could hear a dog barking. Had he missed the UCAVs dropping their payload? Where was Kim? What time was it? He tried to unscramble his brain, scratching his scalp. Out of nowhere, a mug of coffee appeared on the desk. He'd hoped it was Fonseca paying a visit, but it was Alex Gorko. You okay, Chris? I heard the dogs. I thought it had started. All quiet. No calls, no bombs, nothing. No activity at all. Alex pushed the mug towards him. Here, you need the caffeine. Where's Kim? She's gone up top to use the sat phone again. Wow, that really is a museum piece. I didn't realize we still had any. Nobody should be going outside when we're locked down. How else is she going to get a signal? Who's gone with her? Saul. The message had been sent so many times that the key people at APS must have received it by now. Maybe they really were juggling the risks of dieback against the potential benefits of Inatio's propulsion technology. And if they decide it's worth it, we're into the next round of problems. Someone in APS intelligence obviously knew about Opus, or else Kim wouldn't have come here. The question was how much they knew, how much Kim would tell them when she got hold of them, and what they'd do about it. They had at least to be wondering why Inatio had bothered to keep all the ships and where they might be going in Elcano. Because whatever story Erskine had fed them, they'd check things out for themselves. Chris was starting to think that Erskine might have been right, but then he stood in the doorway and listened to the sound of nearly 2,000 living, breathing individuals who had needs right now. Bargaining with APS was probably only delaying the inevitable. But if you could kick the can far enough down the road to distract whoever was coming for you, you could make a run for it. Chris needed to find out what Kim had told APS so far. I'm going to Topside. Alex gestured to the south exit. You'll probably find Mark and Tev. They're mining the doors. Chris zipped up his assault vest and slung his rifle over his shoulder. When he reached the U2-level stairs, Mark and Tev were leaning against the wall, having what looked like a pretty heavy conversation. But you said you wanted to go, mate. 
Mark was saying. They must have heard Chris coming, but they carried on. Kim can get you back to Fiji. You've got to see your kids. Don't chicken out now. Becky won't want me hanging around. Tough. They're your kids as well. Tev glanced up at Chris. Hi, mate. You looking for Saul? Kim, I need to ask her a few things. Get her to come inside, will you? Her boss must have had the message by now. Yeah, that's what worries me. Tev opened the doors to let Chris out. The stairs took him up through the last two floors, deserted and in darkness. A couple of extra layers of protection against a blast. The main lobby was still fully lit, bright enough to be a beacon from the air. The UCAVs would have no problem identifying ground features when they began their bombing run. But there was no harm in making the site as conspicuous as possible to help them avoid a direct hit. Kim was outside the front doors, leaning on the glass with her sat phone pressed to her ear. But she looked as if she was waiting rather than talking. Solomon's quadrobot was standing a few yards away, his snakehead camera staring out into the night, although he could have been observing in any direction. Chris walked up behind Kim and tapped on the glass. She pushed herself upright and stepped back as he pressed the controls to open the doors. I didn't want you to fall in, he said. What's happening? They're not telling me. Tim Pham got the message, though. They said so. So who are you talking to? APDUHQ. It's just one way. I talk, they make polite noises. Call it a day. You've done all you can. Well, whatever I've done, it's delayed something. Tev really wants you back inside. If APDU calls back, how are they going to contact me? I need a line of sight with this piece of junk. If the sensors don't pick up anything incoming, we'll try again later. Solomon trotted in after her. It was nearly three in the morning, and Chris finally dared to think that there really had been a change of plan. He stood on the half-moon marble step out front for a moment, hoping to see fireflies, and tried to work out a timetable. When would they know whether the UCAVs had been stood down? As soon as that was confirmed, Saul would want the bots back at work on the comms links again, and access Shackleton as soon as possible but he might not get much time between then and APS showing up. They'd come for Kim, and when they did, they'd go through this place with a fine tooth comb. We'll adapt, we'll improvise, like we always do. Chris took a deep breath of fragrant night air, not knowing when he'd get another chance, and went back into the lobby. Kim and Solomon were waiting for him. Dr. Kim, if your people decide they want a deal, what's the first thing they'll do when they show up here? Chris asked. Initial debriefing with me, so they know whether to secure the site and which parts to focus on, and then they'll want the research. Kim patted Solomon's frame like a pony. Don't worry, Sol and I have a plan. How about sharing it with the rest of us? It's pretty much what we've discussed. We pretend Solomon's a regular AI. I wheel out Alex as the boss fella, and we carry on prepping Shackleton. I can't help noticing a few gaps in that plan. Okay, there's no hiding opus. We knew all that anyway. We just didn't know how. You don't have to tell them everything about the base, especially now the FTL link isn't working. You're just another eccentric aberration like the Lighthuggers. See, there's the awkward part. Have you ever tried to get 1,600 people to tell the same lie? It's hard enough with two. Believe me, we're much more interested in FTL than Opus. Or your obsolete ships. It's just one planet. There are thousands of others, and FTL means we can find thousands more. This is about opening up deep space. Chris didn't know enough about the science to work out where all this might be heading. Inatio had used FTL to build a glorified comms link. They seemed to have given up on developing something big enough to drive a ship. He understood that much, but Kim seemed to know something he didn't. Hell, she was a physicist, an engineer, a friggin' rocket scientist. Of course she did. 
Saul's got his mission, and I've got mine, Chris said. As long as I get my people somewhere safe where they can stop running, I don't care if it's here or on another planet. He turned to go. Kim put her hand on his arm. Chris, I can guess what you think of me, but for what it's worth, you, Saul, Dan, Alex, all of you, you kept your word when you could have done the easy thing and boarded El Cano. And Grandma Park isn't a cover story. I really do want recognition for her. You've all helped me to do that. So I'll do whatever I can to make sure you get where you want to go. Even if I have to be a little creative in what I tell my political masters. We can all get a win out of this. Chris had heard that phrase so many times from so many people. Usually from guys who were trying very hard to find his price for not beating the shit out of them on behalf of his employer. It never worked. And here he was, thinking that people like Trinder and Zacco trusting him had taught him to be more trusting himself. When push came to shove, his instincts were still to give most folks a wide berth. But I can trust Saul. I'll listen to him. Let's see how things go, he said. He secured the front entrance and followed Solomon and Kim down to U3. Mark sealed the door behind them. Tev had gone. Are we done? Mark asked. Yeah, but we'll check in with APDU in a couple of hours if nothing's happened by then. Mark just grunted. If he had any opinions on what APS was up to, he wasn't going to voice them in front of Kim. I'm going to turn in for a couple of hours, he said. Call me if anything happens. Kim followed Chris to the control room. Trinder was there now, along with Jared, Aaron, and Tev, so nobody seemed to be sticking to the duty roster. They were all watching the sensor display. It would give them ten minutes advance warning if the UCAVs came in range. I think they've called it off, Jared said. Nobody commented. The worst thing about this place was that it was a mix of advanced technology and the Stone Age. Gear that could send a ship to another planet, but that couldn't talk to the world on their doorstep. Chris was used to the patchy nature of civilization these days, but it was especially galling tonight. No, today. It'll be getting light soon. I need a walk. He's given up and leaned against the wall, arms folded. Howie seemed to have found a friend in Mark, though. He was curled up asleep on the bench with his head on the guy's lap. Mark actually looked at peace for the first time since Chris had met him. He caught Chris's eye and put his finger to lips. There, Fonseca tapped the screen. Chris couldn't see it from the doorway. What is that, Saul? I can tell you what it's not, Solomon said. It's not UCAVs. Too slow. I believe it's three stealth aircraft that aren't quite evading the sensor. Well, it's nice to know we can still do something better than APS, isn't it? They'll be visible in 15 minutes. I'm going up there, Chris said. He had the key cards and the sat phone, so nobody was going to stop him. Kim squeezed out of the room and hurried after him. You stay put, he said. If Saul's wrong and you get blatted alongside me, that's his trump card gone. She stayed close on his heels, even though he was taking the stairs two at a time. He's already played it. Why didn't they just insert you a few miles away like spec ops? You wouldn't have believed I made my own way here if I wasn't a tapeworm-infested Rick. Yeah, the parasites were a nice touch. Would you do me a favor? Now? There's something I'd like you to do for me, personal. Chris didn't have time for this. Sure, remind me later. They walked down the approach road and stood on the open land outside the main gate, the spot with the clearest view to the south, and waited. Chris strained to hear engines or disturbed flocks of birds, anything that would give him warning, and tried to recall what kind of aircraft had carried out the bombing last time. Maybe they decided to drop the payload personally today as a courtesy, and this perfect dawn was going to be his last. 
Then he heard the engines. I'll do the talking, she said. In English, please. We generally do in Melbourne. Chris tried his radio, but nobody was receiving. It was a long few minutes. Now he could definitely hear something that sounded rotary. Then three tilt rotors, two in Korean Air Force livery and one in plain dark blue, appeared above the trees. Well, that confirms they called off the UCAVs, Kim said. Chris watched the first tilt coming in to land and spotted APDU decals before he had to crouch to avoid the storm of debris. When the noise and downwash died away, he looked back and saw all three tilts had set down on the grass and their ramps were descending. Crewmen emerged and just stood there. They seemed to be waiting on whoever was in the plain blue aircraft. Is that an official APS ride? Chris asked. Yep. Kim tidied her hair. Nice to see the boss fella show up in person. A dark-haired, dark-suited guy in his forties walked down the ramp and headed their way, flanked by half a dozen people in cheaper but equally dark suits who looked like serious close protection. Tim Pham? Chris asked. Yeah, that's him. You must be high up the food chain. I really sold the FTL hard. Remind him to wash his hands before he goes home. Die back zone, remember? Ha! Huh. One of the CP detail peeled off and approached them ahead of Fam. Dr. Kim? The guy asked, addressing Kim but keeping an eye on Chris and especially on his rifle. Mr. Fam would like to speak with you. He turned and gave Fam the nod that it was safe to approach. The guy looked at Kim as if he knew her. He shook her hand and held it way too long. Chris took a guess that they knew each other way better than they should have. We really thought you hadn't made it on us. Good grief. This is a shock. I nearly didn't. She nodded in Chris's direction. This is Sergeant Montello. I'd be dead from sepsis or something if he hadn't found me. And the people here have been damn good to me, so let's keep the promises we make to them, okay? They're not the enemy. Certainly. Now let's talk. Chris and 1,600 scared people could breathe again. For a while, at least. Now the real horse trading was about to begin. Inatio Park Research Center, two hours later. Solomon scoured the network, erasing all the downloaded feeds from Opus and putting expiry codes into the system to kill all nomad documents that had been circulated. Whenever staff logged in, anything sensitive on their personal screen would be wiped. It would be impossible to get this many people to agree on a cover story on Nomad, and even his own purge wasn't perfect airbrushing, but he'd learned something from Erskine. A few speed bumps placed in someone's path could work almost as well as complete destruction. He removed all the data on himself, too. Phil Berman, now a rather different man in the absence of his boss, helped him to locate disconnected storage so that could be purged as well. I shredded a generation's work a few days ago, Berman said. I actually had a nightmare about it afterwards. I was in Alexandria, burning the library, and people were trying to stop me, but I kept saying, No, we can't let it fall into the wrong hands. I do have a better class of nightmare, I think. It had to be done, Phil. I've stored what I can to transfer to Shackleton. Imagine if they had you in Alexandria. Would it have added to the sum of human happiness if the library had survived? Apparently most of it did, despite the myth. Humans never use the information they've got. They seem to value it less the more they have. But there's a romance in what we don't know or never can. He had a point. Solomon pondered it, then detected some critical key words in a conversation in Erskine's old office that needed his full attention. Oh, I need to eavesdrop on Tim Pham. Excuse me, Phil. Dr. Kim was in the management suite with Pham, being debriefed. She was sticking to English. Solomon wondered if she was being considerate to him and hadn't remembered that he could handle Korean. 
but she sounded particularly Australian this morning, almost as if she was so excited at the prospect of going home that she was slipping back into her real self. She obviously knew Tim Pham very well, far better than Solomon had realized. They chatted like old friends. There might even have been some romantic liaison in the past if their body language was anything to judge by. And Dinesha kept all this secret, even from their staff, Pham said, swiveling slowly in Erskine's big leather chair as if he was trying it for size. Extraordinary. Kim nodded. She was reading the wormhole data for the first time on her screen. Only a dozen or so senior managers knew. The rest thought they were working on dieback or keeping a little general research going in case the world ever got back on its feet. You should have seen them when she broke the news. Mad as cut snakes, Tim. None of them ever signed up for space. And then Erskine took her favorites and pulled the ladder up. So let's be diplomatic with the people she's abandoned. They've been screwed over. So, the FTL research. Pham rolled right over the human issues. He didn't seem to need to pretend to care. They never developed it any further. They tried, but the most they got out of it was a com-sized wormhole to run remote bots. And Erskine trashed all that when she left. But give that data to David Choi at the uni, and we could have a bigger wormhole or a drive on a useful scale in ten years. It's not really my field, but I'm pretty confident. Pham gestured at the big executive office. So, what do we do with the rest of this? IP? Personnel? Plant? Well, there's a lot of data assessment and recovery to do, and I don't know how much Erskine sabotaged, but I think the first thing is to let the personnel who still want to leave get off site. And there are ex Inatio staff who want to move to Oz or Korea and carry on working there rather than ship out to some unknown planet. You've assessed them, then. No point in letting brains go to waste, is there? We've got nearly 500 staff here, with some really good agri-researchers. Seb Melky's the dieback remediation man. His wife, Audrey, she definitely wants to stay because they've got a little girl. She's a biomed researcher. Tissue regeneration, I think. Alex Gorko wants to stay put too. Plenty of useful expertise in everything from life sciences to manufacturing. You'd be knocking on an open door. Have you gone native, Anis? Nay, I just believe you can get more with honey than with vinegar. What about the others? They're mostly the local farmers. They were the food providers, and now they're screwed too. Then there's the refugee camp people who evacuated down here, and a group of Inatia security staff. But they're just perimeter guards. Let them get their old ship together and leave. Then they won't be in our way. The poor buggers probably won't even get to Opus with a ship in that state. But I wouldn't be here without them, and we wouldn't have all that data. Kim had wrapped it all up as if it didn't really matter. The path of least resistance so that APS could concentrate on scavenging data without being distracted by angry, scared, needy refugees. She'd considered the Inatia staff who didn't want to go to Opus too. Solomon had to hand it to her. She was doing what she promised. Did any of their propulsion team stay behind? Pham asked. No. Erskine made sure they left with her. But none of them were a patch on ours anyway. And she's shot through to Pasco Star with her A-team. Those ships must be 50 years old. Tell me about it. I spent most of the last few months fixing them. We still have one big problem, though. Die back. How long can you give them? I'll have to ask the plant pathogen people. But we're not talking long, I'm afraid. Months? Hmm. Twelve weeks. Ah, oh, go on, Tim. If it was that urgent, we'd be irradiated charcoal by now. Okay, but I'll have to confirm that. 
We might need to move in with some pretty heavy-duty defoliant as an interim measure. Just give them a chance. Pham threw up his hands in amused capitulation. Fine. We'll overtake them en route if the FTL data is as good as it seems. Anyway, it's not every day we get to deconstruct the archives of one of the most innovative research corporations in history. Who knows what else is in there? Kim looked pleased with herself. Everybody gets more or less what they want. That's my definition of a good deal. And you? My great-grandmother's vindicated. I just want her honored for the work that was stolen from her. You've done a hell of a job yourself, Annis. Time to go home. Once I'm done here, that'll be terrific. That could be three months. I want to see this through. Besides, the computer network knows me. It won't like strangers trying to access it. Really? Oh, it's not sentient, Kim said airily. I'm just... Territorial. You always were. I don't play well with others, Tim. Your wife knows that. Fam squirmed. Okay, now let's go through the Inatia personnel list. Kim seemed to have things under control. Solomon put his awareness of the conversation in watching brief mode, ready to switch back instantly at the first hint of a problem, and sought out Alex. He was basking in the sun, streaming through the lobby glass, looking wrung out as he awaited his audience with Tim Pham. From what Solomon could see, the farmers had returned to Kill Line to tend to their livestock, and the other townsfolk were discussing whether they should go home yet. That was the problem with good news. It never solved everything, and it spawned uncertainties of its own. Chris's people seemed the most relaxed about the state of limbo they now found themselves in, but then they were used to living from day to day. Some had started moving into the accommodation block, luxurious lodgings compared to their tidy but basic shacks at the camp. Judging by the power and water consumption, the most popular facility was hot showers. Solomon interrupted Alex's nap by making a gentle popping sound in his earpiece. Alex stirred. Alex. Saul, ah, uh, what's up? Dr. Kim just negotiated a 12-week period of grace for me to get Shackleton ready. It'll be very tight. Can you do it? I have to, and she might well have booked your ticket to Seoul. Damn. I'm keeping an eye on her. She really is keeping her word. Yeah, but will APS? I think she's angling to stay here to make sure she sees us out. Alex sat up and checked his screen. Okay, I misjudged her. Nobody trusts a spy. I think they allow for that. Are you working on the comms mast now? I decided to build a new one on the north side of the site. Less visible to our guests if they suddenly get nervous about what's happening. They don't know what I am, remember. This has to look robotic in every sense of the word. Funny, Erskine never worried about you falling into enemy hands. Odd oversight. What's the point in trashing all the records if you're still around? You remember it. She knew I'd evade capture. Yeah, she definitely found that out, didn't she? Alex stood up. Okay, I'm going to recruit some meat bags and go help the bots fix those comms. It won't be long before the APS guys are all over us. No trotting around in your quad either, okay? Don't worry. I'm playing dumb until I'm out of APS's reach. Solomon did another round of the underground floors to see how many people were still down there, then swept the rest of the facility. A group of engineers and mechanics had gone out to the shuttle pens with Trinder to check over their state of readiness, because they'd be needed to. Twelve weeks' preparation was no time at all. It was now three hours since the APS contingent had arrived. Were they planning to stay on? 
and would therefore need apartments, or were they flying out again and planning to send personnel later? He hoped it was the latter. He could get a lot more done if he had some breathing space for a few days. Kim appeared to be doing an efficient job of steering the process, though. And three tilt rotor crews, she was going to earmark one for herself and call it Mildred. You know what gets me, she said. The lies. They don't even have to be really big ones. The small ones pile up. It's a cumulative thing. Any one of the deceits and secrets would have created bad blood in a working relationship. But this was a whole collector's edition. Telling everyone the crew was dead, turning foreign governments into potential enemies by stealing their technology, and then dangling the luxury of instant communications in front of an isolated crew before snatching it away. It wasn't Erskine's fault that the world had gone to rats in Cabot's absence, but Ingram still felt that her crew had been abandoned. Being suddenly cut off without any explanation pissed her off. If Erskine had been that short of time, she could have sent a data burst instead of blathering on with stock excuses. Based on Inatio's previous form, Erskine was lying about something. It could have been anything from someone spilling coffee in the power supply to full tar Armageddon. Not knowing which just left mistrust to ferment. Look at it this way. Haynes seemed happier here already. He'd started sketching, and he hummed to himself a lot. We can't reach Inatio, but that means Inatio can't reach us. We can live like pirate kings, build our own empire, have a bloody good laugh. Put it in the suggestion box, and I'll take a look at it. You know something else? I just realized my ex must have been paid death in service insurance money, and possibly even my pension. But now she's ninety, or dead, so there's that. <laughs> he laughed. Ingram, like everyone else, had put her financial affairs in order before she left. But after the welter of bad news from Earth, she hadn't given any thoughts to being declared legally dead. Just finalizing everything before the launch had seemed like organizing her own funeral. Now she was doubly dead. Hang on, are Inatio still paying us? She asked, going along with the idea because they'd need to have us declared dead to keep the cover story going. But we're still working for them, so how did they hide the salaries? Or did they just stop paying us? If we're dead, it should be tax-free. Ah, oh, if only we could ask Erskine. See, what did I say? Everything they touch is a lie. Haynes started laughing. <laughs> Maybe that's why they cut the FDL link, for tax purposes. Ha! Piracy, it's all we have left. Mark my words. Buckle up your swash and prepare to board, me hearties. Ingram cleared up her plates. I think I'm going to take a rover out for a spin, see what's happening around our lovely new country estate. Look out for frisky wildlife. I haven't seen anything bigger than those rat-sized things, Ingram said. Apart from the crows, I wonder if we've landed on the galactic equivalent of New Zealand. Well, there's a whole planet out there. It might not be all wall-to-wall -wall paradise. Ingram passed the bot hangar on the way to pick up a vehicle, but couldn't stop herself doing a quick detour. She walked along the bays of assorted bots, from shoebox-sized things right up to big excavators, and stopped in front of the four near-identical industrial quadrobots in their charging docks. They must have been part of the original cargo launched more than a century ago. The one that Solomon preferred was distinguishable only by the red logo on one flank, now partially chipped off by constant use. Ingram squatted in front of it, almost expecting to hear Saul's voice, but it was on standby like the others. I hope you're coming back, Saul. She wondered whether he amused himself by passing himself off as a regular bot to surprise the unwary. And when you do, I want to hear everything that's happened. The weather records that Solomon had provided showed rough weather in the cooler months of the year, but for the time being, Ingram could enjoy something that felt like a warm spring. The air was the freshest she'd ever smelled. She drove north towards the mountain range that hung tantalizingly in the distance like a permanent layer of purple cloud.
flat-topped and constantly changing with the light. The xenobiologists hadn't seen her sneak a high-powered rifle into the vehicle, so they weren't going to give her a hard time again about leaving the local wildlife alone. Ecological diversity was lovely, but she didn't plan on ending her days in the slavering jaws of some fascinating new species that she wasn't expecting to run into. If anything started on her, she'd shoot it and have it stuffed for display in the mess. There was probably a bot that could do that for her. Half an hour out, she stopped the rover and got out to check whether the FTL signal had been restored. There was no reason to expect that it had, because Erskine had made the cutoff sound very final, but it didn't hurt to keep trying. She held the receiver up in the air, hoping for a comms miracle, but she was out of luck again. She even clambered onto the rover's flatbed to see if that helped, but nothing had changed. The display showed a flat line where the FTL signal had once been. Standing on the rover's flatbed, she could now see down a gentle slope into the shallow valley shown on her chart. On the south side, there were signs of mining, where bots had excavated raw materials to build and manufacture for their human masters. Track marks had formed faint dirt roads leading back towards Nomad. Mankind had already left its mark on this world before the first human even set foot on it. If Ingram ignored the tracks, the rest of the scene was postcard perfect. A river snaked through the valley and disappeared into a forest the color of red cabbage. The ground around her was covered with short, moss-like turf in a tasteful shade of sage green, dotted with delicate cream flowers. It was such a pretty landscape so tidy and orderly, that it looked cultivated. She mistrusted it completely. It was the sea on a calm day, something to be enjoyed carefully before it turned on her and started rolling the ship, smashing 15-meter waves onto the bows. She was wondering where all the inevitably poisonous, annoying, and aggressive insects were when she caught a flash of blue-black iridescence in the corner of her eye. She could guess who was keeping her company today. She turned slowly, hoping that the creature wasn't going to dive bomb her again, and saw the big black bird, the one she thought of as the parent. She'd seen it a few times now, and had spoken to it like a sparrow in the park back home, begging for crumbs. Sometimes, when those piercing yellow, round-pupiled eyes met hers, she felt it actually understood every word. For all she knew, it was still sizing her up for lunch. But it did seem endlessly curious, and it always watched anyone it found walking around. Where are your babies then, Mr. Crow? she asked. Maybe it was Mrs. Crow. She had no way of knowing. Have you grounded them? She hadn't seen the two smaller versions of the creatures since the day the big one had strafed her. So it had either eaten them or it really was a parent that had warned its roaming offspring that humans were off-limits. The bird settled on the ground about five meters from her, wings folded, bolt upright. Ingram was tempted to get a little closer, but it was bloody big. She decided to give it a wide berth, ready to shoot it if it went for her. She had the flare pistol, too, so she tried to humor the xenobiologists and just scare the shit out of it if it looked like it was getting ready to attack. The big, black, toucan beak wasn't to be trifled with. Don't stare at it. That provokes a lot of animals. They might not be... Move slowly. I think he's looking for his link with home. But he puts the device inside his garment, gets to his feet and stares into the clouds with one hand clutching the strap that holds his weapon on his shoulder. Without taking his eyes off whatever it is he can see, he raises his other hand with the palm towards him. Then he extends his middle finger. He's so still for a moment that I wonder if this is some ritual I should copy to show respect. It takes some practice to mirror the way he isolates a single digit like that. But I manage. He doesn't look at me. You've got yours coming, assholes. He's talking to the air. 
Perhaps I've misunderstood how their communications work. Can another human hear him? I thought their relay was dead. Calm as a bitch. Jeff has done this twice today. I understand how upset the humans must be to know that they can't talk to their comrades. I settle next to Jeff and try to coax out an explanation. Their language is linear and can be learned, but their thoughts, they're layered and tangled. Sad, I ask. Annoyed, angry. With Earth. Whole world? Jeff does a twitch of his shoulders. I've seen the other humans do it. He's still staring into the impossible distance between the hillside and his homeworld, which he can't possibly see from here. Feels like it. He's talking to himself now, as humans seem to. He knows I can't work out what that might mean, at least not yet, so he's saying it to hear the words himself. I must study this habit. They'll be our neighbors for some time. But it would be very good if they stayed. They're soldiers. Soldiers are good to have around when you have barbarians for neighbors. And they seem very like us in certain ways that matter. They watch out for one another. I don't think they're going to get here, Jeff says. How you know? My English is much better now. They say? No, Fred, they don't say. That's the problem. Something bad happened. They wouldn't tell us what it was. And then they cut our comms link. My name isn't Fred, but it's what he calls me. He can't pronounce our initial, Arrah! so that's as close as he can get. Humans are very poor at sounds. They have attack? Jeff looks at me and wrinkles the skin between his eyes, his sign that he doesn't understand. Then it vanishes. We don't know. They just cut the link. So we still can't talk to them, and Solomon can't reach us. I don't understand all the words, but I think he means that his people have abandoned him. Whatever the detail, he's angry and upset. Your kin should never leave you to your fate. This is wrong. I share his outrage. You ask others come? Jeff moves his head quickly from side to side. We can't send a signal, but even if we could, it would take them forty-five years to get here. But Talking Link got here fast. Ah, but it's very small. He makes that smallness gesture, digits forming a circle, almost touching. Our FTL's limited, no big ships. Then he holds his hand as if there's an imaginary sphere clutched in it. Humans are quite good at making signs. Only small objects and messages. Have I understood him correctly? But you hear, how? We set off a long time ago, many years. Cryo? You understand Cryo? He puts his hands together and rests them against his cheek, head tilted. Sleep? Suspended animation. Stasis? Sleep through long go. Yes, that's it. We help. Thanks. I know when he makes sounds to be friendly, but doesn't mean them. I can see the muscles tense under that fledgling skin on his face. We appreciate it. Ah, he doesn't understand. I spread my wings and hold them level. Humans use that gesture to mean flying. We know how make ships very fast. You've got ships, have you? He wrinkles his skin again and looks me over as if I'm hiding something. Do you build ships? Do you travel around the system? Had ships, 
many, many worlds. It's a lot to explain. I don't have the words for it, and perhaps I shouldn't tell him yet about the wars, the barbarians, and the hateful ones we won't work for. Would it do any harm to bring more of his friends here? We're clever, but weak and few. Humans, though, they're clever. They seem to be many, and they know how to wage war. I've seen their reverence for it. We still know how move. We send numbers, and we get talk in the now for you to home again. That sparks a light in Jeff's eyes. He looks right at me. He's suddenly very still. Do you mean drives? You know how to build FTL drives. Jeff makes another gesture, holding his arms out in front and skidding one hand across the other, as if it's taking flight. Humans make much more sense with their hands and faces than they do with their words. Yes, we know what we both mean, more or less. Drives, gates, paths, I say. Does he understand what I mean by that? That we can show them how to travel timelessly, to move around and communicate as easily as we once did? We know where, ways from there to where to where. Quick, safe. And you're willing to share this? I understand share. I've watched them eat. Yes. Needs for friends. What can we give you in return? He points from himself to me. What we give. What you want. What you need. Ah, we're really making progress. Be friends. Jeff blinks and shows his teeth. This is a smile. It's the first thing I learned about humans. They smile when they mean well or when they like something. It goes all the way up to their eyes. Sometimes being able to see the beast trapped inside that featherless skin is very useful. I think we both mean the same thing by friendship. Okay. He folds his arms and nods. Friends. Friends, we help. Friends are important in this part of the galaxy. Sometimes the strife of the barbarians nearly catches up with us, and we need as many friends as we can find. Friends, don't let you down. Friends, stand by your side and defend the citadel as we would defend theirs. We will help the humans, and they will help us, and we'll both survive what's to come. We have an understanding. About the Author Karen Travis is the author of a dozen New York Times bestsellers, and her critically acclaimed Wes Har books have been finalists five times for the Campbell and Philip K. Dick Awards. She also writes comics and games with military and political themes. A former defense correspondent, newspaper reporter, and TV journalist, she lives in Wiltshire, England. Want to read more? For more information, visit KarenTravis.com, where you can sign up for news and exclusive previews of forthcoming books, or contact Karen by email. You can also follow her on Twitter via at Karen Travis. Explore Galaxy's Edge Nomad, The Best of Us, Galaxy's Edge Season 1, Legionnaire, Galactic Outlaws, Kill Team, Attack of the Shadows, Sword of the Legion, Prisoners of Darkness, Turning Point, Message for the Dead. Retribution.
Tyrus Rex, Contracts and Terminations. Requiem for Medusa, Chasing the Dragon. Standalone Books, Imperator. Order of the Centurion, Order of the Centurion, Iron Wolves. Honor Roll. We would like to give our most sincere thanks and recognition to those who helped make Galaxy's Edge the best of us possible by subscribing to GalacticOutlaws.com. Guido Abro, Elias Aguilar, Bill Allen, Tony Alvarez, Robert Onspach, Jonathan Auerbach, Sean Averill, Marvin Bailey, John Barber, Russell Barker, John Bowdoin, Stephen Beaulieu, Randall Beam, Matt Beers, John Bell, Daniel Bendel, Trevor Blasius, W.J. Blood, Rodney Bonner, Ernst Brandt, Jeff Briscoe, Aaron Brooks, Marion Boring, Van Kamak, Brian Cave, Sean Cavett, Chris Joriel Chambers, Cole Chapman, David Chor, Jonathan Clues, Alex Collins Galweiler, Steve Condry, Michael Kahn, James Connolly, James Conyers, Robert Kostler, Andrew Craig, Adam Craig, Phil Culpepper, Thomas Cutler, Alistair Davidson, Peter Davies, Nathan Davis, Ivy Davis, Todd Delarichelier, Christopher Denote, Matthew Dipple, Ellis Tobbins, Andreas Donkick, Cami Dutton, Virgil Dwyer, William Eli, Stephanie Eskrig, Dalton Ferrari, Steve Forrester, Skyla Forster, Timothy Foster, Mark Franceschini, Richard Gallo, Christopher Gallo, Kyle Gannon, Michael Gardner, Nick Gerlock, John Georgis, Justin Godfrey, Louis Gomez, Don Grantham, Gordon Green, Tim Green, Sean Green, Jose Enrique Guzman, Eric Hansen, Greg Hansen, Adam Hartswick, Ronald Hallman, Joshua Hayes, Adam Hazen, Jason Henderson, Jason Henderson, Aaron Holden, Tyson Hopkins, Christopher Hopper, Curtis Horton, Ken Houseel, Jeff Howard, Mike Hull, Bradley Huntoon, Wendy Jacobson, Paul Jarman, James Jeffers, Tedman Jess, James Johnson, Randolph Johnson, John Josendale, Ron Carroll, Noah Kelly, Caleb Kenner, Danielle Kim, Matthew Kinstall, Jesse Klein, Travis Knight, Evan Kowalski, Bile Kravitz, Clay Lambert, Grant Lambert, Jeremy Lambert, Brian Lambert, Dave Lawrence, Alexander Lee, Paul Lizer, Richard Long, Oliver Longchamps, Sean Lopez, Brooke Lyons, John M., Richard Meyer, Brian Mansur, Devin Marinkovic, Corey Marco, Howell Martin, Lucas Martin, Trevor Martin, Tao Mason, Mark Maurice, Simon Mayeski, Quinn McCusker, Matthew McDaniel, Rachel McIntosh, Joshua McMaster, Christopher Menkaus, Jim Mern, Pete McCall, Mike Meitzak, Brandon McCula, Ted Milker, William Morris, Alex Morstadt, Nicholas Mukanos, Andrew Nissent, Greg Nugent, Christina Niemeyer, Colin O'Neill, Ryan O'Neill, James Owens, David Parker, Eric Pastoric, Carl Patrick, Trevor Patillo, Pete Plum, Matthew Pomerenning, Jeremiah Pop, Chancy Porter, Chris Porto, Joshua Purvis, Eric Rittenauer, Walt Robillard, Daniel Robitaille, Joyce Roth, David Sanford, Landon Schall, Shane Shetler, Brian Schmidt, Andrew Schmidt, Alex Schwartz, Aaron Seaman, Philip Seek, Ryan Shaw, 
Christopher Shaw, Brett Shilton, Vernetta Shipley, Glenn Shotton, Joshua Sipin, Daniel Smith, Tyler Smith, John Spears, Peter Spitzer, Dustin Sprick, Maggie Stewart Grant, John Stockley, William Strickler, Kevin Summers, Ernest Summer, Shane Sweetland, Travis Tade Walt, Daniel Tanner, Tim Taylor, Stephen Thompson, Beverly Tierney, Matthew Titus, Jameson Trauger, Scott Tucker, Eric Turnbull, John Tuttle, Christopher Vallon, Haddon Van Buskirk, Paul Volke, Anthony Wagnon, Scott Wakeman, Christopher Walker, David Wall, Andrew Ward, Scott Washam, James Wells, Kylie Wetmore, Ben Wheeler, Scott Winters, Gary Woodard, Jason Wright, Brant Z, Nathan Zoss. This has been an Audible Studios production of The Best of Us, Book One in the Galaxy's Edge Nomad Series. Written by Karen Travis. Performed by Fred Tatashore. Executive Producers Ryan McGavin and Mike Charzuk. Producer Kat Lambrix. Copyright 2019 by Karen Travis and Galaxy's Edge LLC. Sound Recording Copyright 2019 by Audible Incorporated. Audible Studios is a division of Audible Incorporated. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.